Hi and welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thanks for joining me. If you love content around crime, then please make sure that you subscribe as I release new content every Wednesday and Sunday, meaning that if you do subscribe, you will never miss one of my new releases. Today's case is, as ever, very, very sad. And I always want to give a caveat when it involves a child death, because obviously, whilst every single murder is horrific, I always think that child murder is something that stays with us a little bit longer and cuts us a little bit deeper, just because of that natural protectiveness that every adult human who is well-adjusted in the world feels towards children. We all know, for the most part, if we saw a child in distress, we would risk our own lives to save them. So the idea that anybody else could think the opposite, and worse than think the opposite, act in the opposite way and cause a child harm, or even worse, is completely inconceivable to pretty much everybody watching right now. If not, I hope, all of us watching right now. And whilst every single murder is heinous in nature, I do think that those involving a child rank as the worst. And whilst child death does happen, it happens. For the most part, it's accidental or it's due to illness. And even then, it's staggeringly difficult to deal with. But when it's taken in a brutal way, it's just horrifying, isn't it? And when this kind of crime is carried out, it's reprehensible on any level. But when you think that the murder is carried out just for the thrill of it, just because somebody wanted to see what it was like, I think that ranks as badly as it can where any kind of death is concerned. Alyssa Bustamante was just 15 years old when she killed nine-year-old Elizabeth Alton, and they only lived four doors away from one another. In fact, they were regularly seen at one another's houses just because the kids in the area played together. So you're talking about the individual who takes the life of this child literally being one of their neighbours. That's chilling, isn't it? Because firstly, we don't look at 15-year-olds and believe that they have the potential to kill. We just don't. We think 15-year-olds are bothered about their hair, their makeup, what they might be eating for tea, who they might be hanging out with, ideally if there are any parties going on. That's what we're imagining 15-year-olds are thinking about. We don't imagine that they're just sitting at home thinking about the damage that they could do to an innocent child four doors down. Now, I'm not gonna say for one minute that Alyssa had an easy time. She had had a really troubled childhood. She was somebody who had had a lot of family dysfunction, and maybe this paved the way for some of her negative behaviors. But as I will always say, I do not believe a past that is difficult is the reason that somebody can kill in the future. I think it's a contributory experience. I think it's something that we wish children didn't go through. But most children who have horrible childhoods do not end up becoming horrific killers. But nonetheless, I'm gonna acknowledge that Alyssa had a really difficult time. Her mum, Michelle, was an addict. She'd had drug and alcohol abuse issues and she'd also spent time in prison. We do know that children who grow up with attachment and abandonment issues certainly struggle compared to their peers. We know that as a child, you are constantly looking to your adult contemporaries to make you feel safe. Consistent, secure, loving homes are the minimum a child requires to thrive. Even with those variables I've just described, children can still have horrible problems. But if you take away those three ingredients I've just said and plunge a child into a situation where you have addicts as parents, they're not around very often. You're shipped from pillar to post. You don't have those really key foundations that make being well-adjusted an easier possibility than it would be for somebody like myself born to really nice parents. Also, her father was equally as challenging Caesar. He was actually serving time in prison for assault. So we know that when she was looking to her primary caregivers, they weren't really there and they didn't really put her first. Because that's the thing with drugs. You kind of prefer the drugs to your kids. That isn't to say that drug addicts don't want to be good parents. It's just that you can't be a good parent whilst you're an addict because you're an addict, meaning that you are focusing your concentration on drugs or alcohol, which means that your concentration isn't on 
the very things that you need to be spending your time with, which is your children. The fact that her father was actually incarcerated meant that he wouldn't have even had a look in and couldn't have provided her with any security because he didn't have any to give. So this girl has had a very challenging start in life. They are kids that should not really have been born to these human beings because these human beings were not in a position where they could give them the things that they needed. But nonetheless, here we are. So she's had a difficult time. And because of that, she ended up with her grandparents. They had legal custody of Elisa and her three half siblings from 2002. And one of the things that they did was move the children away from California to begin a new life in the country, which basically offered them a really stable upbringing. It was something that they hadn't had so far. First of all, smaller town. So you know you get an opportunity to feel part of a community. Secondly, the physical move from a difficult situation can often be psychologically really beneficial. Think about it. If you're in a challenging lifestyle and you're in a challenging experience and then all of a sudden you find yourself somewhere beautiful, quiet, surrounded with quite friendly people and it feels like a physical and a metaphorical new start, that can be really alluring, can't it? And it can give you that impetus to change and for change because suddenly you can physically see a whole new opportunity, whole new community, whole new life just breathing through that past and breathing in to that new future. And our grandparents want to provide that really strong, structured, boundaried environment that they had been sadly lacking with their very chaotic life with their parents. So on the surface, what does Alyssa come across like? Well, totally regular teenager. She's regular. She doesn't really stand out in any way, shape or form initially. Well liked by her peers. Also have to note, really good student, tended to average A's and B's at high school. So we've got this massively dysfunctional past. We've got these really problematic early experiences. We've got these heavy foundations of problematic psychological experiences, attachment, abandonment and so on. And yet this girl is nailing it. A's and B's at school. So she's committed. And her grandparents are probably thinking, we are doing a really good job. You know, this child to all intents and purposes should be to some degree at least struggling, but she isn't. She's really connecting with what we're providing her and she is doing well. So that setback of her upbringing, of that troubled childhood, at least at this point, doesn't seem to affect her. All of her friends who knew her at the time, they said she was sweet, she was amazing, she was loved by everyone. There was just something about her that people warmed to. And if you see the pictures of her that are from her Facebook, they are just really regular pictures of this happy-go-lucky kid. She's doing her hair interestingly, she's obviously experimenting with a few styles, but she's certainly not lacking friendship and she's certainly not lacking success. But there is obviously something quite deep going on for Alyssa. So what we see here, according to her friends and family, is that she seems to be doing very well. She seems well adjusted. There's no signs to say that they have to be concerned about her. But beneath the surface, there is obviously something bubbling within Alyssa. Because by 2007, she actually tries to take her own life. And we have to acknowledge that to be a very young teenager and to feel so desperate about your situation, so desperate about your world, that you don't wanna be here anymore, that says something very difficult is going on in your head, in your life, in the way that you feel about your world and certainly about your attitude to the future. I often think that when teenagers wanna take their own life, it's that overwhelming fear of the future it's the sense of not knowing where you're going, not knowing what it will mean and feeling completely broken by these possibilities and potentials, particularly when you've had a really difficult past. If you imagine fast forwarding and seeing your life unravel that way, then the idea of going through the motions to try to make it in the world may feel really challenging, almost to a point where you think, I don't know whether there's any point. It didn't work for my mom, it didn't work for my dad. Why should I bother even trying? And even though she's doing well, we see this regularly where people can academically thrive, 
but within their emotional and psychological selves, they're really, really struggling. And to try to take your life as an early teen, it really speaks to me as an adult. You know, you are really struggling. And then her friends notice that after that suicide attempt, there is something markedly different within Alyssa. Her social media accounts change. They reveal a really darker side of her. And almost like there is this evil persona that is just lurking beneath the surface. With Alyssa, I wonder, it's only my subjective experience that I'm giving you, but I wonder whether that suicide attempt, almost when she survived it, she felt like that she'd gone to a very dark place and she'd decided to kill a part of who she was. So leaving the old Alyssa behind and creating this reinvention, this person who survived death, but brought it back with her. So I wonder whether she psychologically connected that sense of, I'm now walking with this death constantly. I know that for some people it's the opposite. When they've tried killing themselves and then come out of the coma or got through it, there's this sense of I've been born again. I feel like I wanna live the best life possible. I wanna make a difference to this world. But equal, I think if you have quite a dark personality, going that far towards death and surviving, there's almost a willingness to think I'm bringing that back with me. And her friends definitely noticed the change. That attempt on her life was really serious. Alyssa was admitted to a psychiatric unit for 10 days. She was also put on Prozac. That would have been very upsetting. It's a really challenging experience to go on any psychiatric ward. It really is. You are surrounded by chaos. It's often incredibly scary because of the other people that are there. You have no control over your environment because you're a child anyway and you're in a psychiatric ward and you're not necessarily aware of when you're going to get out. So it is undoubtedly a scary place for anybody to go. And we know around that time, she starts self-harming. And that tends to be by cutting her wrists. She also starts being quite visual with that. She cuts her wrists, but she also shows her friends the scars. So she isn't just dealing with a willingness to want to harm herself by ending her life. Now she hasn't managed to end her life. She's engaged in quite high level self-harm and she wants other people to notice. And you have to stop for a moment and say, okay, because what people always say, about self-harm in the early stages is it's attention seeking. It's like, it's attention seeking, it's just attention seeking. You're like, yes, it is attention seeking. That's the point. It's not because they are an attention seeker just for the fun of it, it's because they are in emotional pain. It's not one where you go, oh, she's attention seeking, ignore her. It's the opposite. When somebody self-harms, it's like give them attention because they require it because they are really not feeling well. So the fact that she's reaching out and showing people those scars, that isn't to shock them. It's actually to say, I am in pain, I am struggling. And yes, if shock is also something that she sees, that could feed back to her and make her think, well, I kind of like the fact that people recoil and recognize that I am struggling to some degree because it makes me feel that I at least am visible in the world. Visibility is really important to anybody. Think of it. None of us want to be invisible. All of us want to have some kind of meaning to this world. And if you can't get it on one level, you'll get it on another. It's a completely human intrinsic desire. How do I know I even exist? How do I know I've got self-worth? How do I know I have any impact on this world? Unless it's reflected by my deeds, by my experiences, by the people who know me. You need that kind of reflection. So even though she might be getting one that's shocked from her mates, the point is that at least that justifies that she does exist and that she is visible. At this point, she's also placed under the care of the community mental health services. So they are thinking about what to do with her and they obviously are concerned that she is a risk both to herself and potentially to others. And I do know that at the time that the crime was being committed, she was being considered by people in the mental health services as a real severe problem regarding either a danger to herself 
or a danger to others, to the point where they were even thinking about the fact that she may not be acceptable being placed with the community, that she may require long-term inpatient care. So she had obviously triggered a lot of concern within the medical profession. Why they had let her out if they had so many concerns about this person being so dangerous that they were actually thinking about locking her up full time, I don't know. People don't often want to place labels on young people. They certainly don't want to limit young people's opportunities and futures, but it would seem that whoever's gut feeling on those panels was alerting them to think this girl should not be in the community is probably kicking themselves a lot right now. We also know that when somebody is cutting, they are at a higher risk as well of suicide. So around 25% more likely within about four years of the first self-harm to end up having tried to kill themselves than people who don't harm themselves. So it is a big indicator that we may have future suicide attempts when somebody is harming. So it's really important to take it seriously. Now, another strange thing that happened when all this was going on is that Alyssa had this online alter ego. And this online alter ego was very different to this popular girl that she purported to be. On a YouTube channel, Alyssa listed interests, wait for it, that included killing people and cutting. I don't know about you guys, but I think that when somebody advertises on a YouTube channel that my interest is killing people, people might go, that's not okay. I have a lot of cyber friends. I have not yet come across one whose bio says killing people and cutting. I mean, even if you have the cutting, identifying self as self-harmer, understand that because you belong to a community and you're trying to manage it and you don't want to hide around your disorder because you have no shame and rightfully so. But killing people? I think we're going a little bit past what would be considered wanting to meet other like-minded souls. You don't kind of advertise those things, do you? But maybe that's the issue. Maybe the issue is because we all walk around, don't we, with this bias where it's like, no one would kill me. Everybody I know is nice. I don't know any serial killers and so on and so forth. We have this bias to just like think, oh, they're just being funny. High jinx, wanting to kill people. But maybe people could report it either to the people who own the site or to your local law enforcement constabulary. Bit of a tip there. Her Twitter page also discussed the fact that she had addiction terrors and that she had a fear of being caged and buried, which will be a little bit ironic when I talk about what she did later on. She also talked about pain and her search for a reason for it. Because one of the things that Alyssa experienced when she was cutting was that she didn't necessarily get the feedback of agony. You know, when you cut yourself, most of us are like, ow, that really hurt, don't wanna do that again. But for some harmers, we know that the feedback in the brain doesn't work that way. And as opposed to them getting that ouch, it's more of a, ah, uh, it's more of a soothing. So she's looking at pain and wanting a reason to create it for herself at least, but she's also probably at this point, as we know what happens next, toying with the idea of what it would be like to inflict pain on somebody else. We also know that she had a hatred of authority, though that isn't unusual. I had a hatred of authority when I was a kid. I thought that the police were awful. I thought the teachers were pretty awful as well. I didn't think that being told what to do was fun. So I can completely understand that most young people at some point really don't dig people who tell them what to do. Cause you're like, oh God, <laughs> like 15. As if I don't know exactly what to do, I'm 15. The fact that I can't drive a car is irrelevant. I should still be able to. And don't tell me what to do because I absolutely know everything. I don't know how to pay a bill or cook or like sort out the mortgage, but I know everything. That's what you like, isn't it? When you were a kid, is that just me? I just described myself there. I do know how to do that now, so that's all that matters. But when you're a kid, that's the way you feel, right? And the fact that she was so out there with her pain and her angle with authority, yes, we are looking at a young person with some issues, but we could also find quite a lot of people who reflect similar 
bios in their YouTube and Twitter and social media feeds, right? Maybe not the killing bit, but the rest of it. There is also a video on YouTube of Alyssa and her brothers who are shocking themselves with an electric fence. She's the one who kind of instigates it, but there's one of those fences that prevents animals getting out and it shocks them. And she's like inviting that to hurt herself with. And she's getting her brothers to do it too. Is it rolling? Yeah. Okay. I'm about to grab this electric fence with my head. And get the Oh my god, I can't do it. No! I'm driving you for. done that when I was a kid. Have me and my mates, electric fence, thought it was funny, just a bit scary. Knew you weren't gonna die. How often do you walk past the field and there's like loads of dead sheep or cows because they've been near the fence? No, it doesn't happen, does it? But you know, you just wanted to feel what the buzz was like. I'll be honest with you, just like a mild electric shop. But it kind of indicates that she's testing, doesn't it? And the fact that she's getting other people to do it too, that could give us an insight into her enjoying seeing other people in pain. So at this point, we probably are able to say that this girl had issues and alarm bells should have been ringing. I think they were at least on the mental health level. I think that the services were very concerned about her, but I don't necessarily think it had filtered down to her family. Arguably, her grandparents are probably older. They're also dealing with their second time around of bringing up children. They're obviously desperate to make sure that she does well because they've got a point to prove. They've already had problems with their own children. They want to make these kids' lives better. So there's a bias there to kind of think that everything will be okay. I completely understand that. That's the way that most people are in those scenarios. But unfortunately, in spite of all these alarm bells, in spite of all the caution that must have been around, Alyssa, things are going to take a really dark, turn for the worse because Alyssa isn't just thinking about her darkest fantasies anymore she's thinking about making them a reality it's worth at this point noting that multiple assessments that were carried out on Alyssa after she carried out the murder established that she suffered from major depressive disorder and borderline personality disorder so they are difficult conditions to manage per se Major depressive disorder means that you are constantly depressed. It is a major experience emotionally within your life. Your psychology is really low. There is very little emotional effect occurring because you just feel swamped and depressed and down. So it's a difficult thing to manage. And we know that BPD, borderline personality disorder, Individuals with that do sometimes suffer from emotional impulse control. However, neither of those are anything to do with why somebody would go out and brutally murder a child. In fact, people with BPD and depressive disorder are way more likely to harm themselves. They are at risk, 
they're at risk from themselves because their self-esteem, their self-worth, their self-reason is often hugely compromised. Because if you have major depressive disorder and you also have BPD, which makes you feel even more extreme, then you are going to be in a very challenging situation psychologically. So Alyssa is, but I'm not gonna grant her any leeway whatsoever for those major mental health issues because neither of them would create a murderer. The tragic events that led to this murder start to play out on the 21st of October, 2009. It involves nine-year-old Elizabeth Alton, such a gorgeous little nine-year-old girl. Gorgeous. She just looks the absolute epitome of happiness. She's described by her family as a really happy child. She loved animals. She loved playing dress up. She was a real centre of her family. And she'd often go around to Alyssa's house. She was often there because she used to play with her younger siblings. So this is how it was when I grew up. You have your neighbours, you create your friendships and your homes become one another's. And it's such a lovely experience to have, isn't it, when you're a kid? There's always someone to go and hang out with after school. So this community itself, remember, is really safe. So for her parents, of course, go and play. And as I always talk about, there was this sliding doors moment on Elizabeth's final day of life. Because when her friend came to call her, her mother didn't want her to go out. Her mother actually wanted her to stay in. And she actually had to beg her mum to be allowed to go and play after Alyssa's six-year-old sister, Emma, had knocked on. And one of the reasons why Elizabeth wanted to be able to go and play was she'd been practicing for a school play. So she just wanted to have a little break and she wanted to go and hang out, play with dolls, do what they did. So in the end, her mother relented, but she made it very clear she had to be home for her meal and she was only allowed out for an hour. So. Her mum was quite strict, but equally a bit like me. Bit of a walkover. When your child wants to go and play, good parents allow them to, don't they? So her mum had made clear there was a boundary. She wanted her back at a certain time. And off Elizabeth went really happy with Emma. They left the house about 5 p.m. And that's the last time that her mother saw her alive. Elizabeth's mum said the minute that she didn't get home at 6 p.m., that one hour, after she said she could go out, she knew immediately something was wrong. Immediately. It was totally out of character. Elizabeth never returned home late, but it was really out of character because Elizabeth was scared of the dark and she would absolutely never have left it. Elizabeth was scared of the dark. She would never have left it until it was dark to return home. Just like so many kids, when you're at that age, you grow up in these major fantasies in your head, don't you? That the boogeyman's there or that somebody's going to come and grab you. They're the kind of fears that you have. So if you have an issue with the dark, you're going to make damn sure that you get back before it is. Because it was so out of character, because this is a young girl, the police are called quickly to the home. You know, this is a nine-year-old child who's gone missing. A nine-year-old child who was last seen skipping off to her friend's house to play for an hour before tea. The police immediately take it seriously and they start carrying out a search in the woods where she's last been seen. Again, her mother said, this is just not where Elizabeth would have gone. The last place that she would have wanted to go was the woods. Add to that her fear of the dark, it would be Elizabeth's worst nightmare. And if you watch interviews of Elizabeth's mother, you almost get a sense that straight away she absolutely knew something sinister had happened, that it was almost like a realisation and expectation that potentially her daughter would not be coming back. Because it was such a close community, 300 local volunteers joined the search. It's incredible, isn't it? You know, when in times of crisis, the community around you can really save you in so many ways. 300 local volunteers joined the search. What they didn't know was that in spite of them searching, Elizabeth was already dead, the victim of a cold and calculated murder. Now, it transpires that what had happened was that Alyssa had persuaded her younger sister to bring Elizabeth to the woods. So she'd actually asked her younger sister to be involved in the ploy 
to lure one of her best friends to her own death. And that's where she carried out this horrific attack on her. Basically, she convinced Elizabeth that she has something really neat to show her in the woods. So she kept beckoning her to come. She wanted to show her something that was really exciting. And even though Elizabeth would have been scared, this was Alyssa, this was Emma's big sister. Why would she have to be concerned about her? You know, she's somebody that she trusted. She's in that circle of trust. It's just what you do. If it's a brother or a sister of one of your close friends, you might feel a little bit awkward around them, but you know, you've seen them before, you've been with them before, why would you question it? But also, once she's in the woods with Alyssa, she doesn't really have a choice but to be with her. Even if she'd been scared, because we know she's terrified of the dark, she doesn't like being in the woods, there's this older girl with her, she's going to be beholden to her to get her home safely, right? So she's going to keep following her. Alone with her in the woods, Alyssa strangles her nine-year-old victim. She stabs her in the chest multiple times and slits her throat while she lay dying. And then she buries her in a shallow grave. What does that tell you? The premeditation, the calculation. The fact that not only does she use strangulation, she's also got a knife, she stabs her in the chest and then she slits her throat. That is one of the most gruesome killings you can imagine, isn't it? And it's something that she's thought out. She definitely doesn't want her victim to live. There is absolutely no way that she considered it a possibility. And one of the scariest things is that she's got this shallow grave. She buries her in a shallow grave. So she's intending, ideally, to get away with this. What's equally staggering because put yourself in the mind of somebody who has just walked a nine-year-old innocent victim to her death, carried out the murder, covered her in a shallow grave. Where would your mind be? I would imagine somewhere between panic, fear, the reality dawning on you. What did I just do? Oh my God, I'm probably going to get arrested. Maybe I'll get put to death. You know, all these thoughts I would imagine would be going through your brain. So the last thing that I'd imagine that you'd be able to do is any activity, right? But following the murder, she attended a dance. That's right. After she is brutalized, murdered and buried, a nine-year-old child that she selected and walked to her death, she just thought, what should I do now? I'll just go to the disco at the church. Now, on one level, I know what you're thinking. Well, that's quite a good alibi isn't it? If she's seen by lots of people at the church dance, yes, that would make her even more premeditated and murderous. But even if you think, oh, she just thought afterwards, what am I going to do? Probably the last thing that anybody in their right mind would do would be to go to a dance. It is such a juxtaposition, isn't it? Dance, fun, celebration, murder, darkness, horror, totally can't marry the two. And of course, the police at this point are frantically searching for the missing Elizabeth. Those hours turn into days. Just put yourself in Elizabeth family's position. The hours turning into days. Just knowing that something terrible has to have befallen your girl. Wondering whether somebody's driven through and abducted her. Has she been taken by a paedophile? Is she in prison somewhere? All these things would be going through your mind, but what you would know is that something bad had happened. I don't even want to imagine what that is like for a parent to just know that something has happened to your child, to just know. So those hours have turned into days, still no sign of the missing girl. Now, before long, because obviously the FBI have involved, they're questioning pretty much everyone and anyone who has been around Elizabeth. Because one of the things that's cropped up is the FBI has spoken to Emma, who is Alyssa's sister. And Alyssa's sister Emma did say she'd been with Elizabeth, but then that Elizabeth had gone home. But the FBI has spoken to Emma, and Emma does tell them initially that she was playing with Elizabeth, but Elizabeth had gone home. However, her story changes. She's six. Her story changes, and she says, well, actually what happened was we were playing together, but then I got caught in some thorns and my sister Alyssa came to help me get out. So 
we suddenly have the FBI having Alyssa's name brought into it. They also start to do some digging and they find out that Alyssa is the one person who can't be accounted for on the day of Elizabeth's disappearance. So now they have a reason to speak to Alyssa. Now, chillingly, police stated that when Alyssa was interviewed, she was calm, she was collected when she was questioned. She claimed that she knew absolutely nothing about Elizabeth's disappearance. She was very together. They go and search Alyssa's grandparents' property. And during the search, police find a grave-shaped hole behind Alyssa's house covered with leaves. You can imagine what they're thinking at this moment in time, right? They find a grave-shaped hole behind Alyssa's house covered with leaves. And imagine that at that point they think they're going to find a body. But that wasn't the case. They upturn it and there's nothing there. And the police are like, is this a grave that you dug? And Elsa basically admits it and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just like to dig holes and bury dead animals that I find. I mean, okay, <laughs> go on her YouTube and see what she says that she likes doing. But the police find this really suspicious because the empty hole that they look at, it's a perfect size to conceal a small child's body. And they're just doing the maths. This girl seems very together, but then equally admits that what she likes doing in her spare time is just creating a few graves that might put some dead animals in at some point. Not typical teenage behavior. So the additions in their brain are obviously creating the number that feels like it could be related to murder. Due to the suspicions, police get a warrant to search her bedroom. That's the 23rd of October, 2009. That's two days after the murder. Ugh. And you should see pictures of the bedroom because what the police discover totally validates their suspicion because it's nothing like you'd expect of a typical teenager. If you think about what do you expect for a typical teenager, I was a goth, so I like dark things. You know, so at times my bedroom would be put in darker colours or I'd have memorabilia of the, my particular groups that I liked on the wall. That's typical, isn't it? Messy is typical as well. I think if an officer had gone into my bedroom when I was 15, they'd have been like totally typical teenager. I can't see the floor and I do think there are several brands of penicillin growing in that cup by her bed. Typical, that's a typical teenager. Lots of you will be listening thinking, oh no, I wasn't like that, I was really tidy. I had an organized sock straw. But you know, I wasn't, is what I'm saying. But the police go in and alarm bells certainly begin to ring because there's bizarre writing on the walls, some of which has been written in blood. There's also a really crude sketch of a person with slash marks across its head and arm with the name of her sister, Emma, written alongside it. So was Elizabeth the intended victim or did Alyssa play with the idea of harming her sister as well? Because it is really strange to walk into a teenager's room and see things written in blood, crude sketches of a person with slits all over it and the name of her sister next to it. Also, I wanna bring in at this moment in time did her grandparents never go in the room? Is it just me? Am I being judgmental? Surely a parent or a grandparent goes in their child or grandchild's room from time to time. Surely that's standard behavior. If I went into my child's room and they had in blood, their own blood hopefully, painted a crude picture of a person with a slit throat and slit arms, I would have them at hospital within about 85 seconds of the event occurring because that's not okay. It's not normal. There is a serious issue here, but whatever, we'll have to believe that that wasn't the case. It was also during the search that police kind of came across the piece de resistance of the most incriminating evidence, which was Alyssa's diary. And that's when Alyssa really became a person of interest in the investigation. In fact, she became prime suspect number one. The diary seized by the police 
It's absolutely vital in their evidence because it contains various disturbing entries and they are disturbing. One of them describes burning a house down with people in it. So is she thinking about burning down her grandparents' home with her siblings in it? Now she didn't go through with that, but that's obviously on those pages. There's obviously some kind of thinking behind whether she should do it. And as I always say, one of the things about diaries is if you are going to be a master criminal, don't write what you're going to do down. It tends to find its way to court, used by the prosecution against you. Not that I'm trying to give tips to killers. I'm just saying it's a classic stumbling block. Don't record what you want to do because you might not do it, but you might get caught for something and then it might be that you get indicated and implicated because you've written something down that you never went through with that somebody else did, but because you've written it, now you're a suspect. Or if you are the person who actually goes through with it, it's like writing a confession, right? But there it is, in black and white, she's thinking about killing her own family. But it's actually the final entry in her diary that gives Alyssa away. She does her best to blot it out. She kind of really scribbles over it so you can't see anything. And they know that they need to figure out what it is that's behind this scribble. They wanna see, they have this suspicion that she's got rid of that for a reason. Again, I don't know why she didn't just rip it out and throw it away but for whatever reason, she kept it there. Maybe she thinks she can outsmart the police. Maybe she thinks that nobody would suspect her, but certainly the police are clever and think to themselves, we need to figure out what it is. So the way that the police do this is they take her diary and before interrogating Alyssa, because obviously now she's the main person of interest, they use backlighting on the diary entry. So basically all that is, is you literally shine a light behind the diary and you'll be able to make out the actual words. So what they could make out behind that was slit and throat. So again, big alarm bells ringing. Police are definitely feeling that they're closing in on Alyssa. And in time, specialists were actually able to recover the full entry. And that entry described the thrill of the kill, the euphoria that Alyssa had experienced after brutally killing the little girl. And I'll tell you what she wrote. I just fucking killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them. Now they are dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my God, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Okay, I gotta go to church now, lol. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Okay, I gotta go to church now, lol. Just gotta repeat that. She's just murdered and slit the throat of an innocent nine-year-old child and she is buzzing. She's buzzing. You know, after the initial bit where I was like, oh my God, I'm killing a person. I'm like, this is the best thing in the world. And oh, I'm going to go to a dance. If that doesn't chill you to the bone, I don't know what will. It also makes me go, oh my God, I've got teenage boys. And the idea that one of their friends could be having these kind of similar thoughts is just terrifying, isn't it? You know, this ordinary kid that nobody's really thought that much about can suddenly have this terrible intention to want to murder somebody that you love. And yet that's what's happened. A 15 year old, not only enjoying the kill, but being able to just carry on as if nothing had gone wrong, as if life was just okay. Better even because of what she's done. During the interrogation, Alyssa was not cooperative at all. In fact, she would just sit there very silently and it's quite a clever thing to do. If you're being silent, you can't twist yourself up, you can't make mistakes, you can't tell a lie that then causes you problems down the line. So if you're just really quiet and uncooperative, it's gonna make it difficult unless there is a body. If there is a body that ties you forensically to the individual that you've murdered, we have an obvious link. But if they haven't got a body and you're just being quiet about it, then arguably it's not gonna give them the progress that they need. But sadly for Alyssa, 
The police have obviously managed to get her diary looked at and they've seen that that final entry is very clearly suggesting that she's done something really, really bad. And it's at that point that Alyssa's demeanor changes. She basically realizes I'm banged to rights. There's not a lot I can do about that. They've seen that there is an issue here. They've recognized that I seem to have some kind of link to this girl going missing. But she thinks to herself, hmm, how do I get away with this? How do I make it so that somehow me killing a child isn't quite me killing a child? Because she's so calculating and manipulative, she says, do you know what? I did happen to be with Elizabeth, but she fell and she hurt her head and at that point she died. So basically she got ill, she fell over and hurt her head and then she died. So sorry, it's an accident. And basically makes out that they were just playing together and having a really good time and then suddenly it happened that Elizabeth got sick, fell hit her head and died. Obviously the interrogators know that's ridiculous. And they just say to her, well, okay, but you do realize that we're gonna recover Elizabeth's body and there's gonna be an autopsy and we're gonna know exactly what happened. So having thought about what we've just told you, about the fact that there will be an investigation, there will be an autopsy, we will find out what has happened to this poor kid. Can we ask you one thing? Did you cut Elizabeth's throat? And then Alyssa, like, yeah, I did. So again, that manipulation, it's very rudimentary, it's not sophisticated, and it's not gonna wash. So at this point, she has to come clean. She absolutely was the person responsible for Elizabeth's death, and she was the one who'd carried it out. And at this point, she reveals the true horror of her actions. So this is how it played out. This is how Alyssa managed to get away with what she did. She goes and tells her younger sister to collect Elizabeth from her house, which is sinister enough. You know, she knows what she's going to do in her head. She knows she's about to murder one of her sister Emma's close friends in cold blood. So she's getting her young sister Emma to collect Elizabeth for her execution. How cold is that? So after Emma has got Elizabeth from her house, Alyssa tells Emma to go home. And then armed with a kitchen knife, she takes Elizabeth by the hand and she walks her to her final destination, a pre-dug grave in the woods. All the way there, as I said, claiming that she's got something to show her. My God, did she have something to show her. This cold, calculated nature of her actions is perhaps highlighted by the fact that it was a quarter of a mile walk. A quarter of a mile walk. Alyssa had so many opportunities to change her mind, to spare the child, to just say to Elizabeth, go home, to come to her senses. But instead, on that walk, she just continued with a deadly plan. There was no going back. She'd made a decision and she was gonna see it through. And I just want you to imagine for a moment how Elizabeth would be feeling. You know, trying to trust this situation, trying to trust Alyssa, but probably going deeper into the woods and being more and more afraid and worried about what was happening. Probably just thinking, I want my mum. I always think that's how children will feel in those moments. I want my mum. But just following blindly, trusting blindly. And then they get to this grave that's been pre-dug. And I wonder whether Alyssa told Elizabeth that that grave was for her. Then the fight, Alyssa overpowering Elizabeth, strangling her multiple times, multiple times, because believe me, people underestimate what it takes to actually throttle a human being. We are unpredictable. We fight, we bite, we scratch, and it's hard to choke us out. So she does that first, and she's probably not getting where she needs to go. So she gets the knife and she stabs her six or seven times. And if that's not enough, then she slits her throat. This poor nine-year-old, terrified, horrified child. Bleeding out in front of a calm, gleeful Alyssa. The terror that little girl must have experienced in the final moments doesn't bear thinking about. 
Alyssa at this point decides that she is going to cooperate with the police. She knows that she's been found out, so she takes them to where Elizabeth's body has been buried. And again, it's just in a shallow grave. It's covered by a few inches of dirt. The horrific injuries on that little girl perfectly match those described in Alyssa's diary entry. This girl premeditated, planned, and executed, in her opinion, the perfect murder. And I don't doubt for one minute that she thought she'd get away with it. You see, at 15, troubled background or otherwise, there is one thing that stands out about Alyssa's actions. And you see this, in fact, with a lot of serial killers. They don't value human life. So taking this little girl, somebody else's, everything, you know, the parents of that child who adored Elizabeth, Alyssa can't relate to that. Alyssa can't imagine that a child going missing would really provoke that much of a concern. So in her head, because she can't relate to empathy, because she can't understand the magnitude of the meaning of worth of another human being's life, her intention is to murder, get away with it, carry on with her life. What's the big deal? She associates no value to Elizabeth, not realizing that in somebody else's eyes, Elizabeth is priceless beyond measure. Now we know there were warning signs. Alyssa had a troubled childhood. She was raised by dysfunctional, abandoning parents. She had horrible self-harming behavior, suicide attempts, and she definitely had a very dark online persona. But when you look back at what insights there were that gave us true warning to what was to come, one of the biggest warning signs on reflection when you listen to her friends being interviewed is during her 15th birthday party, when she told a friend this, I just wonder what it would be like to just kill someone, to see the life just drain out of someone. I wonder what it would feel like, that type of power to take that away from someone. And her best friend recalls that when she said that to her, she thought it was really odd, but she just kind of thought that Alyssa was acting out. It wasn't real. It's only after that, that she realized, oh my God, that's actually her being literal. She really wanted to do that. Obviously this case was enormous in the area. And when it came to court, the judge ruled you need to be tried as an adult. You've acted in such a way that I do not feel that it is safe for you to be dealt with in a juvenile court. I don't want to see you free for a very, very long time. So accordingly, when you're found guilty in those kind of circumstances, it's life imprisonment, right? So Alyssa appeared in court November 17, 2009. She pleaded not guilty to first degree murder and armed criminal action due to using the knife in the murder. So she actually went not guilty on that. During the trial, so one witness, a police officer, testified that Alyssa had confessed to the crime, claiming that she wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. But, and it was a big but, the prosecution suffered a major blow. The court ruled that Alyssa's confession was inadmissible due to the fact that she was asked questions during interrogation which were illegal under juvenile law in Missouri State. Unfortunately, because she was a juvenile, she wasn't allowed to be asked the questions in the way that she was asked the questions during the interrogation. So that is a major blow. Matters were made even worse at this point by the US Supreme Court's decision to make life sentences for minors without the possibility of parole unconstitutional. So we're now at a position where some of the evidence won't be admissible, but secondly, if it is admissible, there is a chance that she won't even be tried how she's needing to be tried because juveniles, it's considered unconstitutional for them to not be given a parole date. I get why they do that. We all know that lots of young people who are incarcerated do reform and can go on to lead better lives. But I think we have an exception for someone like Alyssa at this moment in time. So in light of this, in January 2012, the prosecution was forced against the wishes of the victim's family 
to offer Alyssa a plea deal to a lesser charge because they basically didn't want to chance it. They didn't want a chance of getting away with it, getting a light sentence. At this point, Alyssa pleads guilty to a lesser charge of second degree murder and armed criminal action. Now, this was a really lucky break for Alyssa. Bear in mind the definition of first and second degree murder in the States. First degree murder is defined as any intentional murder that is willful and premeditated with malice aforethought, while second degree murder is any intentional murder with malice aforethought that is not premeditated or planned. Now, considering Alyssa's admissions that she wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone, the fact that she'd prepared a grave five days before the murder, calculatingly got her younger sister to lure the victim into the woods to her brutal death, and even armed herself with a knife to carry out the deed. I mean, this was clearly a case of first degree murder. But Alyssa's attorney focused on the fact that her client was a child in the eyes of the law, along with her questionable mental state, earlier suicide attempt and clean criminal record. You're only 15, it's not a big deal having a clean, we are meant to have a clean criminal record at 15. Now, whilst I get these are mitigating factors, it certainly, in my opinion, does not justify the lesser charge of second degree murder. But whatever, I understand they had to get some kind of sentence, so that's what they went with. So Alyssa was ultimately sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole in 35 years. That doesn't mean she's gonna get out. It does mean that she'll have a chance though. It's kind of one of those things that makes you conflicted, isn't it? Do you want to see a child of 15 go to prison forever? Do you believe that there is a possibility for restorative justice to occur where she can rehabilitate, when she can grow into an adult who can maybe contribute to our society? Or do you feel that she has chosen her path? She took the innocent life of a beautiful young kid and she makes a bed and she now got to lie in it. What are your thoughts? During sentencing, Alyssa made the following statement to her victim's family. I cannot understand what you guys are going through. No, you can't, Alyssa. You absolutely can't, Alyssa, because you're the person who caused it, but never mind. She went on to say, I'm sorry for that. Are you, Alyssa? Are you really? If I could give my life to bring her back, I would, and I'm sorry. Okay, do that. Bring her back and give your life, because they are all potentially more positive outcomes, aren't they? than her getting to live her life later on when she's paroled. But yeah, that's what she said. I cannot even understand what you guys are going through. I'm sorry for that. If I could give my life to bring her back, I would, and I'm sorry. Were these sentiments genuine? Now, was this genuine remorse, bearing in mind her overall conduct? I don't think so. I think probably that was her defense going, just write this down and say it, Alyssa. Just make people think you're a nice person. It'll count one day in your parole hearing. So as far as I'm concerned, they were shallow. And regardless of what she said, they were of little consolation to Elizabeth's family. They actually rang more hollow, get this, when in 2014, Alyssa unsuccessfully tried to appeal the sentence. I'm really sorry, I'd bring her back in the blink of an eye if I could. I'm a really terrible person, I'm so sorry. Can I get out? Is it possible to get out now? I've been in like a year, is it okay? Is it not okay? Oh, okay. I mean, come on. You either believe that you are guilty and that you deserve to be punished and that you are sorry and you recognize the enormity of what you've done, or you don't. I'm glad it was unsuccessful. Personally, I don't think she would have been safe to have been released. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, that is further evidence of a complete lack of remorse when you consider that she'd already avoided the first degree murder conviction, which by rights she should have deserved. So she's asking for forgiveness. She's saying that she knows that she did something wrong. She's acknowledging the pain that she's caused other people, but she still wants to get out. And she's also managed to bypass the first degree murder. Why isn't she thanking her lucky stars that she might get to see daylight one day? But no, Alyssa is egocentric. Alyssa cares about her own needs and her own rights, and Alyssa wants to get out. Like I said, she didn't. We can rest easy on that, at least. We also know that Elizabeth's family are not happy, and rightfully so, I would not have been happy either. And they take out a separate action for wrongful death, which is brought against Alyssa by the victim's mother. There was actually a settlement of five million. That settlement might seem bizarre, 
Alyssa didn't have any money. But what they wanted to protect was the fact that if Alyssa does at some point get out, or if there are any films made about this case, there are any profits made, that they can get the money from those profits. So it was a clever thing to do, because what Elizabeth's family wants to make sure of is she won't profit from this foul play. And by doing that, they set it in stone that she can't. As far as Elizabeth's mother is concerned, Alyssa is inhuman. She describes her as a monster. And I think we can all agree that if you were in a similar circumstance where this 15 year old child walks into your life, steals your child, murders her horrifically, then laughs about it in her diary, LOL, enjoys what she's experienced, takes her child and puts her in a shallow grave, goes to a dance at church, lies to people within the investigation. When she finally comes clean, she hobbles together some kind of ridiculous story as to why she's innocent in all of this. And when it finally comes out that she did murder her, she tries to get off on a technicality. And she manages to get off on one technicality. We know that she doesn't get tried for first degree murder. So she gets a sentence that's way shorter. Usually it would be life without parole, but now it's 35 years with a possibility of parole. But that's not enough. She goes ahead and tries to get out. She wants to appeal a sentence. This is not somebody with a conscience. This is not somebody who's concerned about the impact of her actions. That's the chilling part of this. Lots of criminals do some really horrible things, lots. And many of those go on to have this huge conscience. It keeps them up at night. I've worked with people who wet the bed in their twenties because they'd been incarcerated and they'd realize what they'd done. The conscience pricks to a point where they can no longer ignore it and it consumes them. They don't want to get out because they don't feel that they deserve to get out. And actually, the way that they become institutionalized is partly to create a bias where they think, no, I want to be in here because they're aware that what they did was so reprehensible out there. Alyssa doesn't feel any of that. Alyssa is somebody who wanted to live out her fantasy. And her fantasy involved taking an innocent, beautiful nine-year-old child under the guise of showing her something fun to walk her to her own execution. That is about as evil as it comes when you consider actions. I do understand that Alyssa had a horrible life. I do not forgive her parents who should have done better, should have known better, should have been better because those foundations are important for children. We have to acknowledge that her grandparents tried to do their best, but again, when you think about the damning evidence in her room, that best likely and sadly was not good enough. We also have to be aware that to some degree, Alyssa was failed. Because if Alyssa is growing into a psychopath, for example, and also has major depressive disorder and BPD, and the services that were meant to cradle her and keep her safe failed to do so. There was a separate meeting scheduled that would have taken place after the murders occurred with the authorities that were gonna explore whether they needed to lock her up permanently. So we know that there were failures there. She'd been in a psychiatric unit, they'd let her home, and yet they were still deeply concerned about this girl being a potential problem, and they were right. What got in the way of that? Why didn't they make sure that she was placed in a secure unit where she couldn't harm herself or other people? They're big questions, all of which could have led to one ultimate change, and that is that Elizabeth would still be alive today. When you look at contributory factors leading to this murder, there were many. Failures in the mental health system, failures in the parenting system, failures where her grandparents were concerned regarding the harm and checking on how Alyssa was doing. There are failures, yes, but we cannot say that those failures were enough to motivate a young girl to not only plan, but to perfectly execute a murder of a child. That is something that she chose to do for herself. And that is something inherent, I believe, within Alyssa's nature. I hope that she gets the help that she needs. I hope that in the end, she gets a therapy, she gets a self change. She's able to work on that very sinister side of who she is. I hope she's medicated appropriately because it has to go one of two ways, doesn't it? 
either we get to 35 years, she gets paroled and she recognises what she did, who she harmed and tries to make amends for the rest of her life, being a good person, working through her therapy, making sure that she stays on track. Or she never gets out. She never gets out. She rots in jail because nobody thinks that she's safe. Because we have to hope it will be one of those. Because if somehow she manages to charm, because she was charming, and be liked, because she was likeable, and manipulate the system, because it's quite easy to do, and that she manages to convince those around her that she isn't a threat, and then one day she walks out of prison free. But still, with that same idea that killing is fun, and the thrill of doing it is worth the consequences of not. Because if that's what happens, our streets, the streets that she walks, will never be safe. Thanks for joining me. I know it's been a tough one. It always is when it's a child, isn't it? And I think that all our thoughts are with Elizabeth and her family at this moment in time. Please join me again when I release my next piece of content. If you've enjoyed this and you haven't subscribed, do it now, immediately. And I'll see you on my next one. Take care, guys.